Hi. Hello. 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 My name is Phil. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'm going to kind of touch on is my last presentation, which was on um, the free trade agreement and NAFTA, and basically how poorly Canada and, and Mexico have done under those agreements. And I'm just going to kind of in general, in general go through it a bit, and then we're going to, I'm going to discuss what's happening now. Um, within our society, there's, there's this mythology surrounding free trade. You know, free trade must be a good thing. Oh my God, it's free. It's got to be good, right? And the same thing with NAFTA and, and the uh, free trade agreements that first put in place. The perception of everybody was that they were good deals and that they were really great for Canada. But what I found out in my research, when I went through the top 20 and then the top 10 performing areas, directly from Stats Canada, in the 20 years before the Free Trade Agreement and NAFTA and the 20 years after, it's horrendous. It's horrendous. GDP down from 20 years before to 20 years after. The business sector down from the 20 years before to 20 years after. Job creation down from the 20 years before to the 20 years after. But that's not the perception that's out there. I mean, the, the mass media are lapdogs of the transnational corporations. And they will even today run articles that tell you Free trade is great, NAFTA is great, free, it's free, it's gotten good, right? That's, that's, that's the part of the neoliberalism. Workers' wages from before, 20 years before to the 20 years after, down. Personal savings from the 20 years before to the 20 years after, down. Personal income from the 20 years before to the 20 years after, down again. Um, merchandise exports by Canada in the 20 years before, 20 years after, down as well. But yet, the perception that's out there and that's pushed by government and by mass media is this is a great thing, we need free trade, we need free trade. It was never about free trade. It was never about free trade. It was about continentalism, it was about building a transnational global agenda in which it was a race to the bottom. And that is where they maximize profits and corporations and corporation rights. In other words, corporations have a right to sue. They're imbued with the rights of a citizen are given to corporations under these free trade agreements. So they can sue for a perceived loss of income. So they can um, move currencies around the world at, at will. So it's, you got the banks involved. You've got the transnational corporations involved, and you've got the big industry involved. So, in effect, what happens is you end up with um, a banker slaveocracy, a global sort of agenda that is a race to the bottom for workers and for people in general. It's about looting and pillaging whole countries and taking the wealth from those countries, but all at the same time, you've got the media telling you it's free trade, it's good for you, it's great. Don't you feel good? You know, you guys look at everything's wonderful. So you very quickly begin to understand that all of these figures are available from Stats Canada on a daily basis. Any one of you can go there and substantiate these figures. How many Canadians do that? Almost none. Almost none. But yet that tool is available to you to kind of, you know, relate to or to cross-examine or understand what's actually going on with it, right? So in a nutshell, that was kind of my, my um, <clears throat> first, the first bit I did on free trade. And so what I was trying to do was show you the, the reality of what, 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 it, what is out there, and then this, myth, this kind of um, you know, fairy la-la land of neoliberalism, where you just pretend everything's good, you say everything's good, and it is good. That's all you have to do. Just convince people to have the perception that it's good. And that's what we that's what they do all the time to us. You know, they sell us a bill of goods and we buy it. That it's good, right? 
So if you want an interesting book on neoliberalism, George Wannabot has done a book on neoliberalism and it's, it's classic. And then Peterson, what's his name? Jordan. Jordan Peterson from Calgary. Don't agree with everything he says, but he has a great view on neoliberalism and, and can articulate it in a way that all of us want to do, but we can't. You know? George Wannabot. And he's very good at articulating the problems with neoliberalism and all that it brings. So that brings us to what's going on today. And of course, Trump's in here. <laughs> <laughs> the trade deal, the NAFTA trade deal, wasn't good for working people in general in the United States, in Canada, or Mexico. And we've all felt the hurt from it, where we've gone offshore with our manufacturing, with our money, with our um, research and development, with every aspect that really defines a country's sovereignty. And this is what this is also about, is we've lost, under these agreements, we've lost our sovereignty, sovereignty to do the best, what's best for the people and that country, and turned it over to transnationals. Ridiculous. You give up your sovereignty as a nation, and your right to act in the best interest of your nation and its people and act in the interest of transnational corporations. Ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So the myth of free trade is that it's a myth. It was never about free trade. It was about entrenching the rights and creating a globalization of, of money and a work pool of labor and a, and a way to monopolize is a big one what's going on out there where they're, they're in control and we're not. So basically we're scrambling, competing against cheap labor all around the world and you know there's this competition going on <coughs> excuse me, that puts us all kind of at, at odds with each other instead of working in the best interest of humanity. It becomes a me first, what's in it for me, what can I get? So it's a very destructive in a humanistic way. So again, I'll tell you, there's no such thing as free trade. It comes with a high price. What we've always had in the past is trade agreements and managed trade. And that's worked well. When you have these agreements whereby it's respectful, the negotiations are respectful, they're, they're done in good faith, and they're mutually beneficial. So that way, you have an agreement with a country where you both are benefiting and it works and you've agreed to it. Not where you just have the wild west and you have the transnationals and the banks in charge and they're going to do what's best for them and their shareholders and their CEOs. As you're seeing with Sears right now, see, the CEOs are getting massive bonuses and payouts and the pension plan is going by the wayside and the people that have worked for Sears for 35, 40 years, are not going to even get a decent pension. That's a classic example, classic, of the type of mentality that's abroad. So again, the fact is that NAFTA and FTA entrenched the rights of, of um, big business, transnationals, and the banks. The one I really like is when they gave the right to corporations to sue for a perceived loss of interest. So in other words, a disagreement arises, and for instance, lumber, softwood lumber is a classic, and where the, we were paying back to the American lumber producers um, a fee for a perceived loss of interest. And of course, we won it all back under Harper, but the deal was this, you lose your sovereignty in the sense that what they were claiming was your workers are subsidized. Your workers have UI, unemployment benefits. Your workers have health care. Ours, ours don't. So there were, where they can even question basic human rights or, or the human principle of taking care of somebody when times are bad. They, they want to throw that out and use that as a, a lever to say you don't deserve those things, therefore you're not, a, you're not, you're not free trading and we're going to punish you. We're going to be allowed to punish you for that. It's a total, it's a total obfuscation of your, of your sovereign rights. 
when you do this kind of thing. So yeah, that's, that was a killer. And they, they've done it on a number of occasions. And of course, we've been in court 35 years now or more, back and forth over soft with lumber. We win every time. They said under the free trade agreement, we were going to get a, a binding arbitration dispute mechanism, the GATT, General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs. Okay, we'll let them decide and rule as a way to solve, resolve disputes. They've been to the GATT six times now. The GATT has ruled in Canada's favor, and it's, it's ignored. Okay, so what kind of a trade deal is that? I don't really see that as a trade deal. So you have to really think about it. In other words, they, they give the right rights to corporations and money and banks virtually more rights than your, than your own citizens. You have to really think about that. Is that the kind of trade deal we want to get into? Where we're, we're putting them on a, you know, a pedestal or an equal playing field even? I don't think so. The big picture is that we really are moving to, the agenda is a globalization agenda. We have to realize that. A lot of what's going on, it didn't just happen, it's been planned. Since the 60s and 70s, they've moved us into this concept of globalization. You have to compete with other countries and cheap, 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 and you know, that's the way we have to produce and we have to compete and all of these things. So they become, it becomes very detrimental to countries that are trying to develop. You end up selling all your resources cheap not taking care of your people, getting loans from the IMF, which are crippling to you. I mean, this it's just, it's planned out. This is not an accident. These things are done on purpose. And they're done to stop development, hold third world countries down, and basically do the same to us. We become, it's just a different kind of oppression or slavery. You know, it's, it's just done in a different method. There's a lot of trade agreements going on right now. There's the CETA, Asian and European, and, and there's the um, ASEAN, ASEAN. And these are bilateral, these are multilateral. In other words, there are many countries involved, and it, they cover a lot of different areas, the agreements. So they're very complex, they involve a lot of countries, and what they're trying to recreate is what they had under NAFTA and free trade because they see that as being threatened because Trump has thrown that out there like we'll just walk away and bad deal and blah blah. It's really it's really stirred the pot, Trump's position on, on the free trade. And you know the attack on Bombardier, um, 300 percent you know tariff really doesn't make any sense. So you don't none of us really know what's going on out there. But let me tell you, things are moving, things are shook up big time. So we don't know where it's gonna land, but it's gonna be interesting. In comparison to that, most of the trade agreements going on with Canada and China are, are bilateral, country to country. There's over a, over a hundred trade missions and agreements now being negotiated and discussed between Canada and China, and it's all on the quiet. It's all being done kind of very quietly. And I see that as they're kind of hedging their bets. They're watching the old empire fade, and they're seeing what's happening, and they're going, okay, Maybe if we're not, if the United States isn't going to be what we thought it was, or those agreements aren't going to work, we're going to go elsewhere. And of course, one of those bilateral agreements was signed under Harper, it was with India. I forget how many hundreds of billions of dollars it was for. It was for lots. Anybody remember? 300 billion or 350? Yeah, it was a huge bilateral agreement. And there's nothing wrong with those agreements as long as, as they're done respectfully, sovereignty of the countries are, are respected. And, and the, um, if they're mutually beneficial, you know, and they're done in good faith. I have no problem with those kind of agreements. But the problem is most of these agreements are done in a way that none of us get to see them until they're already signed off on or they're present, presented to us, <coughs> excuse me, before you really get a chance to even really kind of get off the mark on them. So I'd sure like to see a lot more information being put out there about what's on the table, what they're discussing at least, and, you know, what the direction is, but we don't even seem to get that. So none of us really knows what's going on. So I think what we really need to need to understand is that things are changing. <laughs> and we don't know where it's going to land, but we're all hopeful, as Robbie says, that it's going to be for the better. And um, 
you know, you, you can't have a trade agreement that's positional. If you go to the table and say, where the, the discussion hasn't even started, and you take a, a strong position that is basically going to be detrimental to those negotiations even happening, then you basically don't, you're not going to have a discussion. It's going to go sideways. And, and these, these latest rounds of NAFTA trade uh, agreements or trade negotiations have gone sideways. They've become hostile. And I think the reason they become hostile is because the Liberal government, it was disclosed, it was a week ago, under Canada 2020, it's, the whole election process was involved with the Obama-Clinton apparatus. They used and were working closely with the Obama-Clinton apparatus to get Trudeau elected. The same people, we see signs that they're also working with the NDP. And now if you look at this guy that was just elected to the NDP, um, Jagmeet Singh, it's interesting because he came out of nowhere, wasn't an MP, didn't have a lot of background politically, but this young dynamic guy comes out of nowhere and wins on the first ballot basically. You know, I think second, but he does it very, very strongly. His nearest competitor was 25,000 votes away. The, near, the nearest two only had 5,000 or 8,000. 5,000, 8,000, and he had 30 some odd thousand votes. He signed up 25,000. And he signed up 25,000 new members himself. That's pretty, that's pretty out there. So it just shows you what's... He's got a machine. Yeah, he's got a machine. Everything's in flux. And that's why we're a little bit concerned about this apparatus of... It's quite neoliberal, and some of the negotiations that were going on between the Americans and Canada, Trump's going away from the whole neoliberal thing, climate change, throwing out a lot of the, the original stuff, and whereas we're going the opposite direction. We're going to carbon tax, we're going to raw, raw climate change, we're going to the green, more of a green agenda, doesn't matter where it goes, that's where we're going. You know, and that's another whole discussion in itself. But, so there's this, this dichotomy, this divergence of of um, opinions. So this is what's really stirring things up. So I just wanted to all be aware of that, and I hope that all of you think when you see this stuff being presented as a reality that you question it. You need to question, question, question. And they're always trying to shut down the questions. And we need to, as a people and um, as a country, question what's going on. Canadians have to stop being so passive. There's nothing wrong with asking. There's a lot of power in a question. You just have to ask a pointed question. You don't have to be mad. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to be in somebody's face, but you need to ask the question and stay with it until you get an answer. That's real important. Thanks very much, everybody.